As I've said in all my other videos, it's indispensable when we're reading the stories in the Gospels that we read them in light of the Old Testament. Now, sometimes these Gospel stories draw from one particular part of the Old Testament, maybe from a story from Genesis or a Psalm or a prophecy. And sometimes they draw from all over the place. They bring together this constellation of verses and stories and prophecies in order to portray one big picture of what God is going to do for us in Christ. And the example we're going to look at today is one of those latter examples where we have stories from all over the place pulled together into this composite whole. We're going to look at Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 18. It's the parable of the wicked tenants and the parable of, of the vineyard owner. And we're going to see that Jesus pulls from two different stories in the book of Genesis. He quotes Psalm 118. He alludes to Daniel chapter 2. He also has echoes of Jeremiah chapter 7. And he refers, in, as far as the background go, to Isaiah chapter 5 and to 1 Kings chapter 21. So there's a whole lot that Jesus is going to pull together here in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 and following when he tells this parable. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to jump right into that and we're going to see how the Old Testament elucidates this particular part of, part of the gospel. So first of all, you got to keep two Old Testament vineyard stories in mind when you listen to this parable that Jesus tells. One of them we've talked about already in a previous video. It's from Isaiah chapter 5. It's the, it's the famous parable of the vineyard that Isaiah tells, where basically God plants a perfect vineyard. Everything's just right. It should produce fruit. He goes to look for fruit on it. And instead of finding grapes, he finds what's called in Hebrew stink fruit. And so as a result, he tears down the walls of the vineyard and the vineyard itself is going to be destroyed. And that vineyard is the house of Israel. So you got to keep that vineyard story in the back of your mind. But you also have to keep another vineyard story in the back of your mind. And this one isn't a parable. This was an actual story. It's in 1 Kings chapter 21. They're the reign of King Ahab. Ahab wanted a vineyard. It belonged to a guy named Naboth. And Naboth had this vineyard. It had been in his family for, for generations. And as was the custom in Israel, you don't sell your vineyard. But, Na but Ahab wanted it. And so he goes to Naboth, offers to buy it. Naboth says, no, we can't do that. It's, it's my, my family's vineyard. And so, and so King Ahab, he, he goes and sulks in his house. And his wife, Jezebel, she comes home and she comes up with a plan. She says, I'm going to get to that vineyard. So what Jezebel does is she hires a couple of, of dirt bags who sit beside Naboth in the, in the city feast. And all of a sudden, they, they, they stand up and they say that Naboth has cursed God and the king. They're just making this up. Naboth hadn't done anything wrong, but poor Naboth is hauled outside the city and he's stoned to death for blasphemy. And as a result, then the king gets the vineyard. Now, the reason that story is important as far as the backdrop to this, this section of Luke is because here we have a vineyard being acquired through murder. And that is exactly how the parable plays out as well. So keep Isaiah 5 and keep 1 Kings chapter 21 in the back of your mind when you're, when you're listening to this story. So uh, we jump into the parable itself and there's a, there's a vineyard owner and he rents it out. He goes to a, to, to a faraway country. He's gone for a while and then he sends back servant after servant after servant to collect his rent. And each time he sends a servant, they, they beat him up. They treat him shamefully. They throw him outside the vineyard and they leave him empty handed. They're not giving over what they should. Now these servants that the that the person that the owner sends these represent the prophets, and this is where this echo of Jeremiah chapter seven comes in because Jeremiah seven is where God says, "Hey, to Israel, hey, I, it's like I got up every morning and sent you another prophet, and I got up the next day and I sent you another prophet. I sent you prophet after prophet after prophet to bring you my word. And what'd you do? How'd you react to them? Well, you treated them shamefully. You beat them up. You killed some. You rejected them, and thus in rejecting them, you rejected me." So these servants that the owner sends in the parable, these are the Old Testament prophets. So you, you see really all of Israel's history brought together in this particular parable. So what does the owner do? Well, he, uh, he says, well, what should I do? Well, I will send, it doesn't say just my son. It says, I will send my beloved son and maybe they'll listen to him. Now, the reason this is important is because this language of my beloved son is a direct quote from Genesis chapter 22. If it were just son, that'd be one thing, but it says, my beloved son. And that is the language of Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. In fact, if you look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and you compare it here with Luke chapter 20, except for a difference in pronoun between my son and your son, it's exactly the same. So in Genesis 22, God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, your beloved son, and offer him up as a sacrifice on one of the mountains. Now, we know the end of Genesis chapter 22. Isaac isn't actually sacrificed. The angel of God stops Abraham when he's about to plunge the knife into his son. But 
even though Isaac doesn't die, Hebrews chapter 11, at the very end of Hebrews 11, we have the language of Isaac, of Abraham receiving Isaac back as it were in a resurrection because he was as good as dead. I mean, he was about to die. And so he received him back as a, as, as a type of resurrection. Now, the reason that's important is because in this particular parable, it ends with the death of the son. Uh, sad ending, right? Well, actually, no, because there's an echo, this echo in Genesis chapter 22 gives us hope because just as Isaac lived, so there's this hope that this son also is going to rise from the dead. Well, after he says, I'm going to send my son in the parable, then he sends that son, and when the tenants see him coming, they say, ah, this is the son. Let us kill him, and then the vineyard will be ours. Now, the reason this is important is because that particular Greek phrase, let us kill him, or as in Mark's version has it, come let us kill him. If you, if you take that Greek phrase, come let us kill him, or let us kill him, from Mark or from Luke, either one, you find that exact Greek phrase once more in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Genesis. When Joseph is coming to check up on his brothers, they see him from a distance. Of course, there's intense jealousy between them. And they say, ha, come. There's the dreamer. Come, let us kill him. Exact same Greek. In fact, that is the only place in the Old Testament where that particular Greek phrase is used, come, let us kill him. So when you, when you have your ears tuned into the Old Testament, you're going to hear that story. Now, the reason once more, like the Isaac story, the Joseph story is significant is because Joseph isn't killed. He's thrown into a pit. He's sold into slavery. He ends up down in Egypt, and God uses him to bring about a great deliverance, not only for his own family, but also for the nations surrounding Egypt and Egypt itself. So in both these echoes of the beloved son, Genesis 22, and then of come, let us kill him, later in Genesis in the Joseph story, we hear echoes of hope. That this parable, even though it ends with the death of the son, doesn't really end with the death of the son, because he who is rejected will also be resurrected. Now, after the parable, Jesus says that as a result of the tenants acting this way, God's going to take that away and give it to someone else. And then he quotes Psalm 118. So we have a direct quote of Psalm 118 in which it said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone. And then he uses this language about the stone crushing and turning into dust those who opposed him. Now, the reason that's important is because that particular language is an allusion to Daniel chapter 2. Now, if you remember what happens in Daniel chapter 2, there's a, there's a king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he has this really weird dream. Nobody can solve it except for Daniel. Daniel says that, okay, here's what your, here's what your dream means. Uh, the, the king dreamed that there was a, this huge statue, the head was of gold, the arms and the, and the chest were of silver, the abdomen and the thighs were of bronze, and the feet were made out of a mixture of iron and clay. And then, all of a sudden, there's this stone, uncut by hands, that comes crashing down and hits these, these clay and iron feet of the statue, and the whole thing crumbles. And when Daniel interprets it, he says, here's what's going to happen. This is, the, this is a prediction of the future. There's going to be kingdoms come after you that are silver and bronze and a mixture of iron and clay. And then there's going to be this stone uncut by hand that's going to crush into these kingdoms, destroy them. And the stone becomes a whole mountain that fills the earth. This is a prophecy of the Messiah. The Messiah is that stone uncut by hand that comes and makes a new kingdom a new humanity really in Christ in order that it might fill the whole earth and this is the kingdom this is the kingdom of God so Jesus pulls from Daniel chapter 2 as well to describe what's going to happen when he's rejected so he's the chief cornerstone that God chose but that is rejected in fact that same Greek word for rejected that's quoted there in Psalm 118 is used a couple of other times when Jesus prophesies his birth that he will be rejected so clearly a reference to his coming rejection and crucifixion so after all of this, one more detail that I think is significant. This is, this is one of those cases where you really have to read closely and slowly these stories. If you compare what Luke says with, what, with Mark's version of this and Matthew's version of this, neither of them have this, this little bitty phrase that I think is important. It says that after Jesus tells the parable, then he says the vineyard's going to be taken away and given to somebody else, that he looked at them. Emblepo is the Greek word that's used there. He looked at them. Now, the reason that's important is because that's only used one other time in Luke. It's used when Jesus turns and looks at Peter on the night in which Jesus is arrested. And when he looks at Peter, Peter remembers that Jesus predicted that before the cock crows, he would deny him three times. 
In both cases where Luke uses this word, where Jesus looks intently at someone, he's looking at those who will reject him or those who will deny him. So that, that one particular phrase is important because it joins together these two stories and it shows that Luke is adding a little bit more color to, to the narrative, to exactly what's going on here in Jesus' interaction with, with people. So all of this together, the, the story of Joseph from Genesis, the story of Isaac from Genesis, Daniel chapter 2 and the prophecy of the stone uncut by hands, Psalm 118, which is explicitly quoted, the allusion to Jeremiah chapter 7, and several other Old Testament passages that we don't have time to get to. All of these together form part of this constellation, this beautiful image of what Jesus is saying in this parable, in which God comes to his people, he's rejected, but ironically in their very rejection is their salvation because the stone uncut by hands is going to be the one who forms this mountain, a new kingdom of which we are part by our unity with Christ. And I hope that uh, this has, has uh, brought some light upon this gospel reading pulling from various parts of the Old Testament to give you a, a better and a clearer understanding of exactly what Jesus is getting at in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 and following. And as always, thanks for watching and have a great day.